So today it's my pleasure to uh, chat with Christoph Koch. He's a director of the Allen Brain Research Institute in Seattle and president of that institute, which employs, I understand, 300 plus employees. And they tackle big projects aimed at understanding the complexity of the, the brain, uh, essentially all levels from molecular on up. They've provided valuable contributions to the neuroscience community in terms of resources such as the Allen Brain Atlas of gene expression and, and other projects. Um, Christoph, uh, my understanding you were born in the United States, but then you moved around in Europe and even Northern Africa uh, as your scientific career began. Could you talk a little bit about your background? Thank you, um, Mark. So first, a correction. I used to be president, but I stepped down during the uh, pandemic, and I'm now the, um, the, the chief scientist of one program at the Allen Institute, the, the MindScope program that's focused on building large-scale brain observatories. That's, yeah, I, that's uh, actually good. You maybe have less administrative responsibility. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Um, as you can hear, I was born in Kansas City. Um, and by of German parents, and then they moved around, they were diplomats. So I grew up partly in, as you mentioned, in, in North Africa, I went to a college, René Descartes, which proved to be uh, influential for my subsequent intellectual history. Yeah, and then I got a degree in, in Germany, uh, a master and a PhD in, in physics, where I did what today is called computational neuroscience. And then from there I moved to MIT, to spend four years at the artificial intelligence lab there at MIT in a department of psychology before I moved across the country and became a professor for more than a quarter of a century at Caltech in the professor of biology and of engineering. And then subsequently, Paul Allen, the, the co-founder of the Microsoft co-founder and the founder of the Allen Institute um, uh, um, helped recruit me to the Allen Institute in Seattle, where I moved in 2011, and I've yeah. been ever since. And your your overall goals are, <laughs> you know, to understand the brain and how how it processes information in ways that are meaningful. Uh, and of course, anything in biology and neuroscience, you have to consider evolutionary perspectives. The human brain is estimated has about 100 billion neurons and maybe 100 trillion synaptic connections. And one thing, a lot of my work was on glutamatergic neurons as I think most, it just by default has to be the case with most uh, people because the vast majority of neurons in the brain deploy glutamate as their neurotransmitter, their excitatory. And that's, that's throughout the brain, all over, all regions of the cerebral cortex, subcortical structures. The, the core circuitry involves glutamate neurons and the only way other neurotransmitters modify activity in neural networks is, is by acting on glutamatergic neurons, so GABA, main inhibitory neurons, acetylcholine, et cetera. Have you thought about much about, I know you have, and you've actually started to look at, try to describe sub, subsets of glutamatergic neurons based on certain properties. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because it's something I'm interested in. Yeah, so under um, Hongkui Zeng, she's now a, a direct, the director of the Allen Institute for, for Brain Science and been, been with us since um, the early 2000s. Um, you know, we have this cell typing program, which uh, we do in three species, in mouse, in non-human primate, and in humans. And first focus on cortex, where you use a single cell transcriptional tool uh, either cytoplasmic or uh, particular for human neurons inside the um, inside the nucleus, nuclear RNA, where we sequence a very high resolution. You know where we get between six and ten thousand uh, species of RNA and can classify cells together with morphological classification, where we use a technique called patch seq, where we go inside single neurons, 
inject biocytin to reconstruct the morphology. We do a simple electrophysiological profiling to see how the cell responds to a variety of um, current injection at the cell body. And then we, we, we do the single cell transcriptional description. So we can see in each cortical region, there are roughly 100 different types of neurons, of, of cells. 10 or 20 of those will be non-neurons, and then 70 to 80 to 90 will be neurons. And they differ by the, uh, uh, they differ by their morphology, they differ by the, whether excitatory the inhibitory, which particular subclass of excitatory or inhibitory where their cell bodies are located, the detailed morphology and the genes that are expressed. Um, including with the zip code where they send the information. You know, do they send the information to the thalamus, to the to the to the brain stem, all the way down to the spinal cord, or to the other side of the cortex, or to the same side of the cortex, but up front. So, so you know, in cortex itself, there will probably end up being a thousand different types of neurons, and across the entire brain, it looks like there could be up to you know three to five thousand different types of cells as you know ascertained using um, the genes that express morphology and electrophysiology which of course raises the question well, what's the point why do you need thousands of cells we know in our computers you know if you look at your cell phone or you look at the the, the, the chip at the core of of our laptops they use two or three different type of transistors you know to do everything to do memory and computation and power and we know that's Turing universal. Anything that can be computed can be computed with two or di three different types of logical gates. Why does the brain need thousands of them? The precise answer is we don't know. We suspect it has to do with evolution, with the fact that you know we have this long evolutionary history and accumulated all these different cell types with development. You know, unlike chips, you know we all arise from a single. All of us arose from a single cell, so that has to develop. That imposes constraints. And we also don't know whether they each have a discrete function. In fact, it's unlikely that each cell type has one and only one function on various counts. That's unlikely. So that's the, 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 the challenge to try to understand. First of all, just to get a catalog and an, or an atlas of all the different types of cells, how they're distributed across the brain uh, in different species. We know there's a lot of homology, in other words, Mouse and non-human primates and, and humans have similar cell types, though not identical, and you can see divergences. There's more divergence between a mouse and a human than between a monkey and a human. But it's, there's remarkable similarity. We're all nature's children. And then to understand how these cell types are affected by different diseases. You know, what happens in Alzheimer? Does it first go affect a particular type of neuron? What about ALS? What about all the other diseases, you know, neurological or psychiatric diseases that we are prone to? And many of us have, have of course, the intuition that that all relates to types of cells. It's, it's not generic a brain, a brain disease, but it attacks very specific, at least starts off by, by impairing specific types of cells. And thus we believe it's essential to understand the all the cell types that make up a, a nervous system. Yeah, and that, that selective neuronal vulnerability has been a puzzle. I mean, it's been known for a long time, not at the level you're looking at, but at a more gross level that in certain neurodegenerative disorders, there's specific neurons, say hippocampal glutamatergic neurons in Alzheimer's, dopaminergic Parkinson's uh, neurons in Parkinson's, et cetera. And, uh, you know, there are some clues, but it, it's, it's still far from clear why. Now, you know, people who do coding and, and, you know, computer scientists, essentially, as you mentioned, it just takes binary code or, or, or three. And, but the brain, it seems, is not digital. It seems to me it's more analog. Would you agree with that? Well, it depends. It's both. I mean, it's, yeah. first of all, a general remark. We always, historically, we always view the brain through the prism of our current most powerful technology, right? If you read René Descartes, one of the founding fathers of Western science and also of neuroscience on psychology, you know, he, his technology of the day were these water fountains of Versailles, right? They were powered by various uh, 
mechanical devices. Then in the 19th century, we got electricity. We had switchboard, switchboards, telephone switchboards, and people thought about the brain as a telephone switchboard. Then we had early on computers, and then we got yeah. you know analog computers, optical computers. Now it's all about deep neural networks. Right now we compare to what extent is the brain a deep neural uh, you know convolutional network. So you know. It's not a computer in the sense it, you know, the, the fundamental thing about a computer is you have a complete separation um, between um, uh, between the, the hardware and the software, right? Once you have a hardware, like any laptop, you get anything that's computable can be executed on that, on that machine, whether it's tax returns or watching a movie or video game, right? Our computer, our brains are not like that. Yes, they can be reprogrammed in a sense by training and by learning, but they're not infinitely flexible, right? So I think it's a powerful metaphor. It's a very seductive metaphor, but it's also a dangerous metaphor, yeah. thinking about the brains as, um, um, as, uh, as a computer. And the most dangerous aspect of it is that computers are designed by us and we look at them from the outside. So we can see, we can track the information flow and we can see where something is represented. Brains uh, don't have that. There's no homunculus, of course, inside the brain. And the brain, you know, your brain has to make sense of the environment and what you hear. It's dark inside the brain. All you have are neurons responding to action potentials. Right? There's no central representation. You don't get to a secret spot in the brain where you have like in a Woody Al movie where you have gigantic screens and the outside world is projected. Right? So in that sense, it's, it's, very, it's very seductive. You have to take, to understand the brain, you have to take an intrinsic point of view. What is the meaning of, of, of everything that arises from the point of view of the brain itself, yeah. which is dark, gooey, you know, with electricity, per, you know, perusing through its circuit and somehow, that gives rise to our conscious experience of the world. And so every neuron is different, the morphology, right? There, there's, there's similarities and, you know, there's pyramidal neurons, for example, and Purkinje neurons, which they look like to each other. But when you get down to the actual level of looking at, you know, where branches occur and so on, every neuron is different. You, and nevertheless, and, and every neuron is different within each of our brains and between brains. And nevertheless, this, is, this brain is capable of, between individuals, carrying out a lot of amazing uh, functions, things like language, imagination, creativity, uh, and at some level, it's consistent in those functions between individuals. But I think when you get down to the circuit level, there's a lot of variability giving rise to common, you know, whether it's interacting with environment or thinking in, in terms of streams. And our, our brains tend to work like essentially replaying movies. We're visual people. Uh, our, our sequence, so essentially sequences of representations of images, sounds, that's what we mainly focus on, although there's certainly other senses. So how do you think that sort of um, consistently and consistency in end result versus high variability in the underpinnings? Or do you disagree with what I said? No, we tend to, well, yes and no. So the details of even of, as you point out, even in my left brain differs from my right brain. And even if, in, and certainly also in identical twins, there's some commonalities, but there are lots of differences. Just like if you look at my fingertips, you know, the detailed patterns that the fingertips make, you know, for fingerprints differ between the left and the right, but there are many commonalities. For example, all of us who are, grew up visual sighted have a visual cortex, 
that's at the back of your brain, right? The occipital cortex. And most of us, the vast majority of us have the speaking area that's in the inferior frontal, left frontal gyrus. We know that from stroke patients, et cetera, right? So there are commonalities, but as you point out, there are also differences. For example, you said, well, we can all imagine, but that's not true. It turns out there are some people who have aphantasia, right? Who are unable to do, um, um, who are unable to, to have visual imagery of the sort that most people have, right? So if you really do very careful mapping of individuals and their sensorium, turns out, so for instance, we know 7% of men are colorblind. Even, not, even people um, who have, you know, the regular complement of three different color cones, the exact shape, if you look at the distribution of the individual cones, they differ. You may remember this internet phenomena called the dress. Do you remember that from the 2015s, where on Tumble, this woman posted from a wedding in Scotland, the wedding dress, and there was massive disagreement. Some oh, people yeah. saw it like white and gold, and other people see it black and, um, uh, go and blue. And uh, gold and blue, it's just a fundamental difference. And most people cannot switch. It's not something where everyone can see it either as white and gold or blue and black. They just see it. So there. So if you look really in detail, there are significant differences between each one of us. But on average, we, we perceive roughly the same. Otherwise, of course, we couldn't, we couldn't have a shared world. In fact, we share the world with monkeys and dogs and cats and, and other animals that see slightly different things or smell different things. But by and large, we, um, we, we all see roughly the same thing. Otherwise, we couldn't have survived. Otherwise, we wouldn't have made it through the last you know, billion years of evolution. But there can be lots of differences. And the interesting thing is to map out the difference to try to understand for instance, I, I, I became very friendly with Oliver Sacks, a neurologist, and I, I realized he was sort of seemed to be very shy and didn't like company and turned out nothing of the sort. He said, and he's written about it, he was face blind. And so he could not see, he couldn't uh, instant, you know, we all have this instantaneous ability to see a face as a face. So we look at a face like our president, we instantly say, oh yeah, that's Joe Biden. We can say that's an, uh, an elder white male. And, you know, we can register the face expression. People with face blindness, prosopagnosia, there's nothing wrong with their eyes. You know, they can see the, the eye and they can see the mouth and the, the, the individual features of a face, but they for various reasons, they are unable to put it together into a holistic perception of a face. And so he felt uncomfortable in public places like restaurants because he didn't know who he was talking to. And he always invite, you know, invited me to his home where he knew, okay, now Christoph is visiting and you know, he, he knew who I was. So, so it turns out you know, it's not that uncommon face blindness. So there, if you look really under the hood, there are lots and lots of differences in the way we perceive the world uh, among each of us. And with, with Oliver Sacks, did, was he born with that, that deficit or was it acquired at some point? Do you know that? I don't. Okay. But he certainly never talked about a stroke or anything like that. I mean, there are two forms, a so-called developmental face blindness where you always had it. And then... Um, the, the other one is where you, you, you grow up normal and then, you know, it's some, typically as you get older, you have a stroke in that part of the brain and, and you lose the ability. He did, so it, I suspect it's probably more the former. Yeah. It, on it, the it, other it, hand, their super recognizer, for example, the New Yorker had this article on this person with the Metropolitan Police Force in London who could see a face once and would never forget it. And you could test it. This person had this amazing capacity for recognizing and remembering individual faces. Never forget a single face. So, you know, there's a broad distribution and that's probably true for most traits. Yeah, and that's, that's an ability that was undoubtedly critical during evolution, right? I mean, you, you wanna be able to differentiate friends and foes and yep. uh, parents and everything. Um, now, so the, the brain develops, it, it's very dramatic, right? If you consider how rapidly the brain develops during embryonic development and how rapidly new neurons are formed and they grow and the connections are made and then there's pruning and so on to arise at kind of a 
baseline, I guess you'd say, circuitry that then can be modified by experience. Um, so one thing I've often wondered, and, and I did my, actually my postdoc work, uh, this was in the mid eighties, I discovered that uh, glutamate plays an important role in formation of synapses during brain development. At that time, it was thought neurotransmitters act after synapses are formed. And so one thing, and then we did a lot of work on energy metabolism, and I got thinking about, you know, I look out, I'm, this might be interesting, you probably thought about, so I look out at trees, right, where this is well established, that the branches grow in kind of what's called a fractal mm -hmm. manner to maximize their ability to acquire sunlight. Mm -hmm. And I've often thought that during development, the growth of, of the, the branching patterns and where synapses are formed might be determined in part by uh, energetic considerations like focal access to, um, to, to energy. And we did some studies recently showing that, uh, um, that of course it's known during development, mitochondria proliferate and they fill the neurites and that mitochondrial biogenesis can be stimulated by activation of glutamate receptors and, and neurotrophic interactions. So have, have you thought about the, the role of um, energy efficiency? We know the brain's very energy efficiency. There's actually been comparisons with computers and so on, but have you thought about roles of uh, energy distribution and access in computational functions, specific computations the brain does? It's a good question. I mean, there's this paradox that, you know, the brain uses, uh, you know, 20% at rest of the resting energy uh, of the resting power requirements of the body, uh, although it, it's much less than 20% by mass. And then you have neurons like Purkinje cells that fire all the time at 200 hertz, right? How is that compatible? Shouldn't they, shouldn't they fire at one hertz, uh, you know, and then increase maybe occasionally to 200 rather than having a baseline firing rate of 200? So that seems to, on the face of it, contradict that. Um, I think power is one of many constraints that the brain has to operate. Um, and I don't think, I, I, although I'm a physicist and physicists like to have sort of, you know, like a hedgehog, look at everything through a lens of one thing, like power consumption, I think it's just one of many constraints mm -hmm. that the brain, uh, that the brain has to, has to obey. Yeah. In the retina, it may explain why we have on or off cells, right? Because it turns out it would be much more expensive to have cells that have a high baseline rate. And then when there's a decrease in light somewhere, you, you the firing rate decreases. And when there's an increase in light, it increases. And the way the brain seems to have done it, to have two different sets of neurons, one only respond to the onset of light and the so-called on neurons, and then the off neurons only respond to reduction, to the um, reduction of, li uh, of light. So that seems to be a question of energy efficiency. But I don't think that means that everything in the brain can be explained by- um, No, no. By, by no, energetic, I was by just minimizing thinking about energy. Some of the, the branching patterns of neurons, and it's not all neurons, but some of them you look at it, and obviously this is thing neuroscientists it's very striking, right? These they call them dendritic trees and dendritic arbors, and, and but and some so seem to so. So it's an interesting question that you raise there. The, the geometry of those, and you know, if you look at the diameters, you know, of the daughter branch, the two daughter branches compared to the mother branch, there seem to be several different laws operating here. If you just look at, if you want to match the electric impedances, you get a law that's called D D D three and a half law where the diameter of the parent to the power three and a half equals the sum of the individual daughter diameter to three and a half. 
when you're looking at something like volume, which scales with energy metabolism, then you want the square, then you want the the square of the of yeah. the dot of the uh, you know of the parent branch equals to the sum of the squared of the daughter branches, and yeah. different neurons seem to do different things. There was recently an analysis of that. Yeah. Um, so you want to you, you want to briefly talk about your your work with Francis Crick. But I mean, the, the, the other thing, uh, Mark, sorry, just in yeah. terms of power, what's remarkable that the brain itself has almost no power reserve, right? So if, if someone chokes you, right, your jugular artery, right, so you don't yeah. get the oxygen to your brain, you faint, you lose yeah. consciousness, your brain sort of goes into the shutdown mode within eight to 10 seconds, right? Because there, there is no backup power system. So in order to conserve power, the brain shuts, you know, shuts down and you lose consciousness, right? And cer certainly during evolution that, you know, being under conditions that would reduce the blood supply of their brain that dramatically were not encountered very much. Otherwise there would have been well, I mean, in tupor, a, tu a tupor, of course, in hibernation, right? That's a very common case where the ah, brain yeah. doesn't go. So in, it turns out hibernating mammals don't just go into sleep, sort of their, the EG looks quite different from the EG of a sleeping, of a, you know, when you look at ice bears or, or you know, some, some, um, some rodents that, that, that hibernate, they don't typically have a sleeping EG. They go into this much deeper state, tupor, a tupor. Um, because they are, they are really trying to conserve uh, energy for two or three months at a time, right? And then occasionally they'll wake up, they'll go into normal sleep, and then occasionally they'll wake up and wander around for a day before they go back into this two-poor state. And their body, tem their body temperature goes down and yep. just yep. kind of simple thermodynamics, it's yep. going to, yeah. Uh, yeah, so with Francis Crick, yeah, so in, um, you know, almost uh, well, more than a quarter of a century ago, um, I, I met through my advisor, Francis Crick, and we got very friendly, and both of us were interested in this question of consciousness, and we found it a scandal at the time that consciousness was considered a no-go area for, for, for neuroscience. Uh, and people felt it wasn't appropriate for scientists to, to study consciousness, which both Francis Crick and I felt was uh, inadequate. The central fact of my life is that I'm conscious. When I lose consciousness, like in deep sleep, I don't exist for myself anymore. Right? When, when in deep sleep, not in, in REM sleep where I might have dreaming experience, but in deep sleep, I simply cease to exist just like under deep uh, anesthesia or in death when th there is nothing anymore. So consciousness is everything I am. And to exclude that question and how consciousness arises in a lawful way out of, uh, out of the body in general, or we now we know, of course, it's the brain in particular, seemed just really shocking, this neglect. And so we argued at the time, and I think that's been taken up now as a battle cry, let's forget about for now about you know materialism or physicalism or dualism or weak epiphenomenalism you know all these different isms that philosophers have have invented to try to un come to grips with this mind body problem let's just focus on what are the minimal set of neuronal mechanisms that are you know jointly necessary for any one conscious experience like the one i hear your voice or you hear my voice or i see you on in my zoom box and where's the difference between seeing and hearing? Where's the difference between seeing you and seeing, you know, someone else and smelling? And are there different neurons? Are they different? Are they of a particular cell type? Are they in a different particular part of the brain? When do they first occur? You know, in, in a fetus, in an infant? What happens in anesthesia? What happens in coma at the end of life, etc.? So there's a very large range of questions that 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 makes uh, accessible, and you can do this in normal volunteers, you can do it in patients, you can do it in, in, in animals. So it's a vigorous field now studying what's called the neuronal correlates, the footprints of consciousness in, in the brain, primarily the mammalian brain. Yeah, and then, of course, in the humans, in animals, you can do invasive procedures and, you know, manipulate specific neurons. And But the, the weakness of the animals in looking at consciousness is they can't talk. They can't communicate with you. So, the, sure, the, they can communicate with me. Well, they can't talk. But they, 
can plentiful communicate just as much as a baby, by the way. A baby can't tell me about, can't directly yeah. speak to me. Neither can a patient that has a phas a phasic or a patient in akinetic mutism or vegetative state patient. None of those patients can, some of them can still communicate, although non-verbally. Yeah, so it makes it a little bit more challenging. But as I said, I have a dog here, Bernie's mountain dog sitting next to me. And I know pretty, I have a pretty good idea about its conscious state it is. It wags its tail, it barks, it points its ear. It has all sorts of ways. Charles Darwin wrote about it, right? Well, no, no, but what, what I was getting at was like, if you're, you have a rat or mouse in the laboratory and are, you can look at like some crude behavioral responses, but you can't do a, an experiment equivalent to what Wilder Penfield did, uh, you know, in the epilepsy patients where he actually put electrode in different regions and then, you know, the person, you know, he'd stimulate one place and the person would say, oh, my wife just came in the room or something like that. That's what I was getting at, that, that kind of level of, of trying to probe the human brain for well, yes and no. Again, I have to disagree, uh, Mark. Okay. Yes, you're not going to get a verbal response from a non-verbal, non-human animal. But, for example, John Monzel, right, has done this in Chicago, where you systematically map the visual cortex of a monkey, yeah. you know, using electrodes, just like you can do, like uh, Joseph Parvizi has done during neurosurgery in patients, we know when you stimulate with an electrode um, during, let's say, prior to, to, new, uh, to neurosurgical intervention, you stimulate the visual cortex, you get what's called phosphenes. You get like flashes of light. And they're in a particular part of the brain, depending where you are in visual cortex. In the appropriate part, there is this map of the visual environment that gets mapped onto visual cortex. And depending where you stimulate, people report that they see flashes of light. You can do the very same experiment in animal, in, in, a, in a trained monkey, trained to respond to tell you by pushing various levers to tell you what it sees. Uh -huh. So again, yes, obviously they will never talk to you, but there are other ways of getting at, at content of what they see or what they hear. Yeah. Okay. What is, what is your definition of consciousness? I mean, that's experience. kind of the key point. Uh, experience, any experience. Okay. And Seeing, hearing, smelling, being in love, being angry, being yeah. worried. Those are all different different states of consciousness. Yeah. Any experience having to resulting from interaction with the environment or from internally generated. Uh, yeah, like in a dream, right? You yeah. dream, you have very vivid experiences. They're different. Typically you don't have a self. You're not surprised when you, you know, walk through walls or fly or encounter a long dead relative or partner or friend, right? But you certainly, you can love, you can hate, you can fight, you can see, you can smell, or you can and take, you know, drugs. Does, con or... does consciousness require nervous systems? We don't know. Yeah. All, it's not clear. So the, 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 then you need a theory of consciousness, ultimately. All we can say that in animals like us, or like closely related species, yeah. like dogs and cats and monkeys, it seems to require cortex. Um, other animals, you know, if you look at the complexity of the brain, their behavior, like squids, they also seem to be conscious, even a bee, but of course they also have a nervous system. If you go to other anim to other creatures like plants, like trees, I know there are some claims that trees are conscious, it becomes just much more difficult to establish how do you know? Uh, that's a question. What, what, what test ultimately you have? Or, or, or we need a fundamental theory a theory like integrated information theory that says, you know, rigorously starting somewhere with ontology or ca causal power, something like that, what exists, what doesn't exist and what has consciousness. Otherwise it becomes, if we just rely on our intuition, well, I think a tree is conscious because it's alive, then it just gets, um, we have to move away from our intuition. We can use our intuition as starting point, but then have theories of consciousness and then try to test them. Yeah. Um, yeah, the plants are interesting. Uh, turns out, so, so I'm, I wrote a book, is it the publisher now? It's called Sculptor and Destroyer, Tales of Glutamate, the Brain's Most Important Neurotransmitter. Huh. And I have one chapter cool. on, on evolution. 
you know, glutamate as a signaling molecule in evolution. And in plants, um, there were studies quite a while ago showing that plant cells can respond to glutamate. And then with the advent of molecular biology, there are homologs of several glutamate receptor subtypes in plants. So, you know, and, and this makes, I mean, probably most signaling mechanisms in the brain uh, obviously it evolved from signaling pathways, signaling mechanisms in organisms before there were brains. But it's kind of interesting that that aspect of it. Yeah, we, I, I say we're all nature's uh, children. Yeah. yeah, I mean, my personal opinion is based on integrated information theory that it, that the feeling of 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 that experience might percolate through most of the tree of life, yeah. although of course it becomes dimmer as you go towards simpler simpler creatures that have simpler cells, where the dynamics is perhaps more sluggish. Um, so it may well be that conscious experience is coextensive with the tree of life to some extent. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean. For even my dog, much of us love dogs and their, their cortex is of course very similar to us, doesn't have a, a voice in the head the way you and I have, you know, the voice that nags me, you know, I haven't done this, I had this fight yesterday, et cetera, et cetera. Dogs certainly don't have that, but they have, you know, there's no doubt they can love and hate and bark and be angry. And so similar, if you go down the sort of, if you go down to simpler creatures that have fewer neurons, I think consciousness likewise scales down. Yeah. But even a bee, you know, there's a glutamate equivalent, they have octopamine, you know, they can have the waggle dance, they have, you know, complex communication system, even the the, the simple bee may well have a state of happiness and a state where it's unhappy for a variety of reasons. But to test that right yeah. now, it, it is challenging. Yeah. So there is, is, of course, this very ancient belief called panpsychism, right? That ultimately uh, everything is ensouled to some extent, which is now resurfacing in, in philosophy. Uh -huh. Well, I'm very weak on philosophy. So, um, yeah, I, I didn't, I never, never had that much interest in it. Um, what are your most exciting projects going on now at, at the Allen Institute and, and elsewhere are you, through collaborations? Well, we study, for instance, in here at the Allen, we study the response of human neurons to, we, um, to psychedelics. You, you know, you're well aware that psychedelics are enjoying this renaissance now, both in the general public as well as among um, for possible treatments of a variety of psychiatric and maybe even neurological conditions like depression, uh, treatment resistant depression, uh, PTSD, etc. And we know almost nothing about the response of these drugs in human neurons. What we do know is EG and some fMRI. We know nothing about human neurons or even in non-human primates, which particular cell type respond, how do they respond to, let's say, psilocybin or psilocin or, you know, 5-MeO DMT or DMT or all these other substances. So trying to get a better understanding of that. And we work with neurosurgeons here, but where about once a week, we get a little piece of, of, of human tissue, like a sugar cube from neurosurgery, and then we can put it in a dish and study human neurons, not animal, but human neurons, you know, that came from a patient to, to an hour ago. And, and you know, add uh, various psychedelic to the, to, to the fusion or directly spritz that onto the, the neurons. And we study um, consciousness in patients where we try to detect the tens of thousands of patients in a so-called vegetative state that due to anoxic or vascular uh, or traumatic brain injury, they're unable to communicate with you. Uh, and they, most of them are probably not conscious, but it, there's diagnostic uncertainty there. Are they, and are they present but unable to tell you and how will they recover? To trying to develop tools to ascertain that, sort of to build a primitive conscious meter for these patients. Um, so doing a variety of of, um, of experiments um, around around those topics. And are those subjects in, that are in 
a vegetative state. So typically there's functional MRI done on them. Is that right? No, it's done very rarely because oh. it doesn't, it's very expensive. You don't, it's not part of the standard clinical workflow. Yes. So as you point out, there are, of course, some famous studies. There was a New England Journal of Medicine and a science paper by Adrian Owen. They found that in a small subset of patients, probably 5%, that based on behavioral criteria would be classified as uh, non-responsive. So being in a vegetative state, but um, two of them, could communicate, it could, sorry, could, if you ask them to imagine walking around the house, we know a particular part of the brain, like the parahippocampal place area gets activated, it got activated there, then you ask these people who you can talk to, well, you can talk to, they don't respond back, to imagine playing tennis or soccer, and then part of their higher order motor cortex gets activated. So in in, in those patients, we know they, are, they they do have they seem to be conscious, but because they're so grievously injured, they can't communicate. And so we know that some of these patients are misclassified. Most that's of the the, that seems really important. It, uh, doesn't it seem like it would be a big value to do FM, um, um, MRI because uh, yeah, but you, it, it could make a big difference in what decision is made about the Totally, person. totally. Yeah. So a many of these people, so in this one study, New England Journal of Medicine, I think they had more than 30 subjects, only two of them could respond. So the vast majority of people cannot. Maybe it's a cognitive routine that required, you know, you have to think about, you know, if you say yes, think about playing football, uh, soccer. If you say no, think about walking through your house. That itself may something may be something that these patients aren't, because they're on the brink, clearly, may not be able to do. Most patients didn't respond at all to fMRI, but it's it's very challenging in a, you know, if you've ever been in an emergency room, it's very difficult there to fit that into an everyday workflow where you do this and it takes a long time. It's quite expensive. So it's not a practical tool. So we need tools that are much easier to use um, uh, way with higher sensitivity and specificity, you can ascertain are they conscious or not. Something that you know you can do once a day quickly. You know you measure like some so sort of device where you quickly measure, and in five minutes, you know today he's conscious, and no tomorrow he's not conscious. You know some of them will fluctuate. Are you involved in any studies that use TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation? Yeah, so this typically will involve TMS, okay. uh, where you you essentially knock the brain by applying a TMS, let's say over posterior parietal or cingulate or premotor structures. And then you, you have a high density net or 64 channel EG, and you look at the reverberation um, of the brain of cortex in response to that, uh, to that yeah. knock. Yeah. And then you can comp comp uh, compute something like the complexity, it's called the lempel ziff you can compute the complexity of that uh, response. And it turns out brains that are conscious, like you and I right now, or when we're dreaming, or when we are, you know, let's see, uh, under ketamine, which is the dissociative agent, complexity is high, but if people are in deep sleep or anesthetized, complexity is low. So that's essentially how this particular trick, how this particular test works. Okay, now I'm thinking back to your psychedelic thing. Uh, uh, work with psychedelics. Are you able to get brain tissue from, from these human subjects with her undergoing brain surgery from different brain regions? Or is it usually from one brain region? It's 70% comes, so of course this is purely dictated by clinical need. Sure. Uh, so typically 70% of it comes from the medial temporal lobe since that's where the majority of epileptic seizure originate. Most of the rest comes from prefrontal cortex, anterior cingulate. There's very rare a need for a surgeon to remove anything, let's say, from the back of the brain, occipital lobe, because there are very few um, seizures that originate from that part of the brain. So at this point, much yeah. of this we, we, uh, uh, we've published already, um, we, um, it, it's very limited. Where you get the tissue from and of yeah. course it's not from thalamus or let alone from the brainstem so there's quite a bit of data i had uh franz volnweider yeah on one of the earlier podcasts and you know he's done a lot of brain imaging with franz volnweider and zurich yes i know him well yeah and he's right at the epicenter of, of psychedelics right 
Hoffman and LSD and psilocybin yep. synthesis. Yep. And yep. he, um, you know, so your work recording from individual neurons in the tissue can kind of bridge in a, a big gap, right, in our understanding, because the functional MRI, it's not very, the resolution is poor. I, I mean, it's, that, it's, it's relatively poor compared to what you're doing. Yeah, it's millimeters, and in a cubic millimeter, there are 50,000 to 100,000 neurons. Also, the um, serotonin, serotonergic drugs, of course, also will affect the vasculature itself, right? Serotonin, the name itself, implies, you know, zero, serum, blood serum, and then tonus, uh, the uh, tension, right? It affects the, 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 the state of the vascularization. So th you also have to correct for that problem. Yeah, so we need, like anywhere in neuroscience, we need, you know, measurements at a variety of scales. We need EG, MEG, and people are doing that. We need fMRI and uh, arterial spin and other imaging techniques. Um, and then we also need single neurons or cultured cells or, um, you know, in vivo in, um, in, let's say in rodents, you know, we need all these different techniques to get a comprehensive picture of, of what goes on. Could, do you have to end right, at, at right soon now or? Yeah, in a couple of minutes. Okay, I'll ask you what, What's the status of, so I know the state of Washington legalized marijuana quite a while ago, or decriminalized it anyway, right? Yeah. And what's the status of, of mushrooms and then? The and city has decriminalized it, the city of Seattle, city. but I, not, not the state yet. Mm -hmm. Oregon, I believe the state has, decriminal, has decriminalized it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we'll see what happens. The next step will be, so there are two big uh, clay, uh, phase three clinical trials, one by MAPS that uses MDMA, you know, ecstasy for treatment resistant, um, uh, no, for post-traumatic um, stress, including severe post-traumatic stress in veterans. And that trial is gonna end next year. And then if it's positive, as so far all the evidence looks like, then the FDA might, D uh, schedule, you know, schedule one is drugs that have high addictive potential and no possible use. So A, serotonergic drugs are not addictive, mm -hmm. unlike of course opiates, and B, then there would be demonstrated use. They would they would be um, descheduled for, this is always in conjunction, it's very important to emphasize, we're always talking about psychedelics in combination with psychotherapy, right? So for the, the MAP study, I believe it's up to six uh, sessions therapy, you know, two before and then two sessions during and then afterwards. And these are, the session could be eight hours or something like that. Same thing with the USONA trial, a phase three trial and for the COMPASS pathway uh, for a tre uh, either treatment resistant depression and or major depressive disorder. This is psilocybin, the active ingredient in magic mushroom, again, together with psychotherapy FDA might approve that in 24, you know, 23, 24, and it would then be descheduled. And you can go to your doctor and say, please give me this off label for my cluster headaches or yeah. for my depression or for my, you know, for a variety yeah. of ills. Johns Hopkins, where I'm at, has a big program now. They started a center on Roland yep. Griffiths and yep. his colleagues there. And yep. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I think it's, you know, it's unfortunate, unfortunate there was this you know, big gap, 50 year gap, essentially, and uh, not the government not supporting research on these. And uh, yeah, for a variety of reasons, partly yeah. self caused. Um, yeah. You know, when you go around <laughs> and people got scared, right? Timothy Leary, turn yeah. on, tune in, drop out, yeah. together with the anti Vietnam demonstration that has spooked too many people. And so Nixon passed the, you know, Controlled Substance Act. Yeah, and then yeah, all research got got shut down. But you know, these substances are powerful and they can be dangerous, and so therefore one has to move deliberate and always yeah. do it in conjunction with psychotherapy. Yes, and addiction is another potential. Uh, yes, yeah. There were there are some papers came out in uh, sixties, you know, before they shut it down in the sixties, suggesting. Alcoholism, yeah. Yeah, alcoholism, yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully those kinds of studies will continue to go forward and there's some potential there.
Okay. Um, yeah, I enjoyed talking to you. I'd like to talk a lot more on some of the nitty gritty Lots stuff. Lots of interesting topic to uh, questions to talk about there, uh, Mark. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you much. Okay. Uh, uh, send me, uh, can you ask your publisher to send me a copy of your book? Yeah, well, I, it's, it's, I haven't got the proofs yet. I, I wouldn't mind sending you a copy. Um, oh, yeah, as long as you don't do anything with it, then somehow the publisher finds out I sent it to you, then I might get in trouble, but. Wait, wait, wait I don't understand. Well, <laughs> no, why can't you sell? I, I don't know, because of copyright issues, but. Oh, um, no, 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 don't, no, plus I don't like reading books on PDF. I spent too much time on the oh, computer. Okay. I hate reading books on PDF. Okay. No, no, I'm surrounded by real books here. I'll, I'll send you a copy when it comes out. Yes, that'll be perfect. Okay, thanks a lot, Mark. Take okay, care. Okay, Christoph. Have a good rest of the summer. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.